Philippe Muyukure has spent the last five years living in a refugee camp in Tanzania. Now he's on his way home. He's among thousands of refugees convinced that Burundi's bitter 10-year civil war may be coming to an end. I haven't heard anything from my mother and my family since I fled five years ago. I miss them and I want to see them. Burundi is struggling to emerge from a civil war between Hutu rebels and the Tutsi-dominated army. Over one million people were uprooted by the conflict and more than 300,000 killed. Fears of genocide, a repeat of what happened in neighboring Rwanda, have never been far from the surface. Now, a peace accord which features a temporary power-sharing government has put an end to most of the fighting. But just as Philippe and others are making their way home, there are new questions about how best to defuse future conflicts and the role that economic development plays in building lasting peace. Bujumbura, Burundi's capital, looks like a city under siege. Perhaps that's because here in the country's political center, the war hasn't really ended yet. In the hills surrounding Bujumbura, the only rebel group to refuse to sign the peace accord continues to launch attacks. While on the streets, people are bracing themselves for the country's first multi-party elections since the war began. Burundians are uh, afraid of elections. Early in 1961, the first leader of Burundi has been assassinated just after the elections. 1965, the first prime minister, who was Hutu, also assassinated just after the elections. Then, in 1993, the first elected president, Mercure Ndadai, has been also assassinated after the elections. So you see, there is a reason for Burundians to be afraid of elections. These fears are intensified by the 55,000 former rebel fighters who have yet to give up their weapons. Our fighters have no trouble to go back home to start a new life, but they need some financial support so that they can start again. If that is not the case, someone who has been holding a weapon for years will not hesitate to get another weapon and use it to take what he wants. Tipping the scale toward peace requires rebuilding the country's economy quickly. Not only to give rebel soldiers a reason to turn in their weapons, but to rebuild hospitals and schools and to give all Burundians a chance to start again. All of this requires money that the government doesn't have. Since the war began, export revenues from coffee, for example, have fallen by half. Before the war, Burundi managed to feed its population. The government could pay its civil servants without too many problems. Nowadays, we must borrow from the central bank in order to pay their salaries. And although international donors have pledged one billion US dollars for Burundi's reconstruction, less than half has been dispersed. People promised to give money, but it never came because they say the country is not secure. But without financial means, many of the programs we hope will aid peace cannot be achieved. This is the paradox. War-ravaged economies like Burundi's need outside assistance to offer people an alternative to conflict, while international donors want peace before they commit funds. Yet for the 150,000 refugees expected to be repatriated at transit centers like this, the time seems right to be coming home. 
Philippe fled after his father was killed and rumors of more killings spread throughout his village. There have been so many killings between Tutsi, between Hutus, and they were provoked. They were the, the cause of politicians. The politicians of these two ethnic groups manipulated poor villages by exploiting their ethnic differences and then used it as poison. When Nelson Mandela and other African leaders negotiated Burundi's peace accord of 2000, they agreed politicians had exploited ethnic divisions originating a century earlier with European colonialists. When the colonial administration came in, they applied the, the policy of divide and rule. So you had a minority of Tutsis that were sort of um, nursed as a superior race, and the majority of Hutus were despised as uh, by nature bound to be servants of the other ones. After Burundi's independence, the Tutsi minority exploited these divisions, taking control of the government and military. Hutus have been excluded from the politics. There were very few who were elected or who were appointed in the public sectors. The current situation is resulting from those exclusions. Hutus are coming back in their country, and that is a very good thing, but they still have a frustration in their spirits. Agreeing to share political power has eased some of those frustrations. But for Philippe and other returning refugees, there are still many obstacles to overcome. Cassian Nyandwi is trying to rebuild his life alongside former enemies. It happened at night. We were all here in this house. My daughter was asleep with me when the attackers broke in. I took her and ran away. My wife also ran, but she wasn't fast enough and they caught her and killed her. People need to talk about what happened so they can restart their lives, but there are no authorities who can listen to us and we still fear reprisals. After 10 years in a refugee camp, Cassian recently returned home to discover his land had been sold to another man. Cassian is a subsistence farmer. He can't survive without land. Yet with hostility and anger still smoldering in his village, a direct confrontation could be dangerous. Cassian hopes to find a peaceful solution instead by taking his case to the Bashangantahe, a council of wise elders in his village. The Bashingentai are trying to do their best to reunite the Hutu and Tutsi and to reconcile them so that they can live in peace and forget what has divided them. The Bashingentahe is one of the only traditional institutions to survive European colonialization and war. For hundreds of years, councils like this one have diffused conflicts and dispensed justice. Its members are considered the wisest and most trustworthy in the community. Now, in the wake of war, these traditional reconciliation councils may be the only hope for continued peace in villages across the country. Cassian tells the Bashangantahe that the land in question was his grandfather's and his by right. The other man, who says he bought the land nearly a decade ago, wants compensation. Burundi is one of the most cultivated and densely populated countries in Africa. More than 90% of people here rely on farming for their survival. The population is growing bigger, but there's not enough land to go around, so people try to steal land from their neighbors. The Bashangantahe are ready to deliberate. But before they do, 
they send Cassian to fetch some banana beer, a traditional drink used to aid solidarity. If there is any controversy associated with the Bashangantahe, it's that the majority are made up of married men. Although this one is more progressive and includes a woman. Finally, the verdict. In traditional conciliatory fashion, the two men are told to share the land. Cassian and the other man accept the decision. But even in this straightforward case, the solution cannot solve the underlying cause for tension in the community. <laughs> This land is not enough for me and my children to live on. If we could get some aid of some kind, that would help. Otherwise, no one can say this land would be enough for a family to survive. In this area, we are running short of land. Land is also on Philippe's mind as he makes his way home. I'm going home to start a new life, but I know I'll face some problems. Before I left, I had a coffee plantation and some goods, but I have no idea what's happened to them or to my family. I don't know what to expect. A truck from the transit centre leaves Philippe at the municipal office closest to his village. Government services that had collapsed during the war are only now beginning to reopen. After re-registering, Philippe considers how he'll get home and the challenges he'll face once he gets there. As far as the economy is concerned, the situation is drastic, almost catastrophic, because all indicators have gone down. The literacy rate, the GDP, everything has fallen. As a result, the population now lives in a state of extreme poverty. Just as war increases poverty, poverty contributes to the desperation that fuels war. Even before the conflict started in 1993, Burundi was among the world's poorest countries and relied heavily on foreign aid. As fighting escalated, international assistance dropped from 300 million to 50 million US dollars a year, and all but a few development organizations abandoned their projects. But in provinces such as Kayanza, where work continued, the conflict took a different turn. Those areas, the war have stopped a long time ago because the youth there have something to do, other interests. Throughout the conflict, we maintained our presence because it's better for us to be there, give them a plow, give them tools, give them seeds, to give them, you know, the sort of, the means to, 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 to maintain the dignity. Because once you have nothing to lose, the option of taking the machete or taking the gun becomes very attractive. With ongoing international aid and attention to economic development, some believe Burundi's war would have ended a long time ago. That would have been better if the international community have continued to support Burundi by constructing, by cultivating, by building, by doing this and that. So people will have uh, no time for ethnic oppositions. Well, it's a sort of a, a catch-22 situation. You want some basic security conditions in the country in order to be able to resume or to continue working. On the other hand, they need resources in order to meet those conditions. So I think one has to, to be a little bit flexible. Sunday morning in Muhanga, a regional center in Kayanza province. In the catch-22 world of conflict and economic development, this community may have found some answers. In the past, government authorities decided which regions would get assistance and what kinds of economic activities 
will be developed. They chose the beneficiaries. Now it's different. It's the community development committees. Community development committees, made up of members democratically elected from the villages they represent, were first introduced by the UN agency IFAD while working in Rwanda after the genocide. When we started to work in Burundi, uh, we were faced with similar problems of disharmony in the community, mistrust. But in addition to that, we were left with communities that were left on their own because of lack of resources due to conflict and lack of uh, international resources. For Casilda Gampamwe, a single mother with nine children, Mahanga's development committee offers a grain of hope and a chance to build a future, something that politics and conflict have denied most Burundians for a long time. Since my husband was killed in the war, we have been moving here and there, looking for refuge. Our situation is very bad. We have few clothes to wear and little food to eat. And we don't have any tools to cultivate crops. Casilda wants a better life, so she attends a development committee meeting. In communities like Muhanga, development committees are the economic equivalent to the Bashingen Tahe, except they use international aid and development projects to rebuild and strengthen communities. Economic development is a vehicle to bring people around the same table, to make them understand that they have common concerns, they have common needs. So what we're doing is we're saying, forget about your differences, but we want you to think, what are your needs in order to become normal communities? Members of the Mohanga Development Committee have decided to identify all those, like Asilda, who are in immediate need of help, and then root aid their way. They use traditional mediation practices, and everything is done publicly, including displaying the names of those chosen as recipients. <laughs> traditional methods like this help reduce the risk of corruption and favoritism that fueled conflict in the past. There are some people who think the development committee does not work fairly. But often those are the people who would like the aid to come directly to them so that they could make a profit from it or give it to their friends. Widows like Casilda are the poorest people in their communities. Before being selected by the Mahanga Development Committee, she and her family lived on just 47 US cents a day, the amount her eldest children earned making bricks. A few weeks later, hundreds of people, including Casilda, gather at the municipal offices in Mohanga to receive a portion of their aid packages. In this case, a handheld hoe and an opportunity for Casilda to begin growing food for her family again. Since development committees were introduced in Burundi four years ago, nearly 1,000 have been formed in communities in half the country. Today we are in a final phase of forming development committees throughout the province. We are analyzing how to incorporate the fight against AIDS, conflict resolution, the entire national reconciliation process, health and education, so that these committees address all aspects of integral development for the people. And as their numbers and responsibilities have grown, so too has their sense of political power. The political empowerment is an additional uh, benefit that maybe initially we did not uh, foresee. But the political empowerment in the environment of Burundi is very important because the whole governance system has to be rebuilt, has to be reconstructed. In terms of local governance, CDCs are the answer. They present a political model that is not in place. They are pluralistic in nature, they are inclusive and representative of their constituencies. 
as Burundians brace themselves for elections, a grassroots movement that promises local empowerment and development with assistance from the international community may help keep the peace. When these people get a certain amount of autonomy, they can come up with their own priorities for government to support, etc., etc. There, you're going to work at the level where the, 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 the conflict doesn't exist. Despite 10 years of fighting and so many killings, the conflict is, 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 is something that these people feel is imported and imposed on them. It's not something that belongs to the population. Which is particularly important now, as security in the entire Central African region comes under threat. The only Hutu rebel group not to sign Burundi's peace accord recently claimed responsibility for the massacre of more than 150 Congolese Tutsi living in a refugee camp just inside Burundi's northern border, threatening to draw Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo into an even larger conflict. Yet as refugees like Philippe make their way home, what they bring with them is hope. Perhaps this time, things will be different. Right now, I'm happy to see my mother and my sisters. Everyone is safe. But I'm wondering what I'll do next. Peace is not only the absence of war. I don't think there can be peace when people can't grow enough food to eat and there are no other jobs or opportunities to help them. If nothing is done, this situation could provoke another war.